Testing. Testing, testing. All right. Look at that. We actually caught a microphone issue with testing. This entire time, I've been saying testing, and I've never had an issue. And now, we finally have an issue, and we catch it. So look at that. We're going to keep doing that. Uh, happy Monday, and welcome to another stream. Today we're going to be doing uh, a paper reading. We're going to be reading a paper that we were going to read last week, but ended up getting pushed. And this paper is called 12345. Any single image to 3D mesh in 45 seconds without per shape optimization. So this is the uh, GitHub landing page. So the github.io. It's basically a website that's hosted on GitHub. And uh, so far there's nothing in the repo. So if we actually look at this repo, it's basically empty. So they'd say they're releasing an online demo code coming soon, exclamation mark. So I don't know, hopefully they release it, but we don't know for sure. Um, very visually appealing uh, stuff here. We got a bunch of different 3D objects here. So these are meshes, right? And then on top you have a single image. So the whole point of this paper is that you're going to be able to go from this single image into a colored 3D mesh here. And uh, not only is it a mesh which has of course vertices and all the 3D information but there's also a texture applied to it right so you see how there's basically this uh, a color for every single uh, vertex and area of this mesh and face of this mesh so it's the whole the whole thing you know uh, it looks a little bit over engineered there's a lot of different moving parts here but I don't know. I thought it was somewhat interesting. I also thought the the uh, teams here were also interesting. A lot of different universities here. You got Adobe Research. Okay, so there's money there. IIT Madras. I think this is one of the uh, Indian technical schools. These are very competitive and, and hard to get into, so generally indicative of high quality work. You got a Chinese university. And then you got Cornell, and then you got UC San Diego and UCLA. So like kind of a huge spread of different academic institutions and then Adobe Research. So kind of an interesting research group. Um, cool. So let's not beat around the bush anymore. Let's go straight to the actual paper here. Let me drink some coffee. All right, 29 June 2023, this paper is starting to be a little bit old, maybe a couple weeks at this point. Uh, single image, what they're referring to is a single RGB image, right? Just like this, three channel image. 3D mesh is a collection of vertices and faces, right? You guys probably know what meshes are, meshes 3D. Pretty much any video game, any CGI you see in a movie, it's all based around this uh, concept of meshes. Now with generative AI, we can generate things directly in 2D, but for decades and decades, because this has kind of been the pinnacle of 3D, is these kind of mesh formats, right? So the more vertices, the more, uh, the finer your resolution is, generally the smoother the appearance. Uh, 45 seconds, we'll see what that refers to. We don't know what kind of hardware they're doing this on. And then uh, without per shape optimization, kind of what they're talking about here is that a lot of these uh, types of 2D to 3D papers, they, they run these kind of optimization processes, and those are specific to the uh, object, right? So if this paper, let's say, was like a Nerf paper or something, you would probably expect that for every single one of these objects, they would train a Nerf from scratch. and that ends up taking a lot of time. So the without per shape optimization means that they 
train it once and then it just kind of like zero shot works for any uh, image supposedly but I bet you if we uh, read the paper the without per shape optimization isn't going to be as <laughs> uh, clear as they make it seem uh, okay, single image 3D reconstruction is an important but challenging task that requires extensive knowledge of our natural world. Okay, many existing methods solve this problem by optimizing a neural radiance field, this is just a nerf, under the guidance of a 2D diffusion model, uh, but suffer lengthy optimization time. So this is kind of what I was talking about here, where most of these 2D to 3D papers, they will create a nerf but that nerf will be specific to a single shape so if you wanted to create a new nerf for a new shape you would have to basically run through uh, the pipeline again uh, and that would be lengthy uh, 3d inconsistency results and poor geometry so I mean this just different ways of saying bad there isn't like a super formal definition for what either of those is in this work, we propose a novel method that takes a single image as any object and generates a full 360-degree 3D textured mesh in a single feed-forward pass. 360-degree uh, 3D textured mesh, also kind of a weird way to describe it. Any 3D textured mesh can be viewed from any 360 degrees. There is no 3D textured mesh that isn't 360 degrees. I think what they're trying to say here is that the mesh doesn't have any holes in it and is generally kind of viable semantically plausible from any uh, view angle is what they were trying to say here uh, in a single feed forward pass so and whenever you perform inference with any kind of neural net or deep learning based system that's generally called one feed forward pass the forward there is the direction you're going right if it was a backwards pass then that's referring to training or pushing gradients backwards uh, given a single image we first use a view conditioned 2d diffusion model so it's a 2d diffusion model like uh, stable diffusion although here it sounds like they're using zero one two three and here view condition means that the diffusion model is conditioned on a view right so we've seen how diffusion models you can condition them on text in order to generate a specific type of image but you can also condition them on pretty much whatever you want and here they're conditioning it on a view uh, to generate multi-view images from the input view and then aim to lift them up to the 3d space okay so it seems like there's a multi-step kind of pipeline here first you generate a couple images and then you uh, convert to the actual 3D mesh and texture. Since traditional reconstruction methods struggle with inconsistent multi-view predictions, we build our 3D reconstruction module upon a SDF-based generalizable neural surface reconstruction method. So SDF is a sine distance function. So this is another very popular uh, format that keeps coming up in these papers, sine distance function. And uh, what a distance function does is it basically tells you the distance at in any point in 3d space to a surface right and the signed merely refers to the fact that whenever you're outside the surface it's going to be positive and then inside the surface negative or vice versa but basically it's another way of representing a 3d object by kind of postulating a, a some kind of function that if you query that function at a specific point in space, it'll tell you how far away you are from the surface, right? So it's kind of like an, an implicit mesh. I don't know if you want to think of it that way. So here, for example, in this picture of this uh, rabbit here, uh, I don't know what the fuck just happened here. Here we go. No, can I see this? <laughs> uh, open image, a new tab. There we go. Yeah, so you see here for this rabbit, the uh, SDF inside the rabbit has a value of less than zero, and the SDF outside of the ra rabbit has a value greater than zero. That's what the sign means. And then the there's kind of this implicit boundary, uh, which is the surface. And why do people use SDFs? Because they're a function, and deep learning models are function approximators. So 
generally if you have some kind of problem you say okay well let's imagine there was this magical function that did this thing that took what we wanted to give it as input and then produce the output that we wanted and then okay now let's approximate that function with a deep learning model or a neural net uh, okay so that's what the SDF means generalizable is the whole uh, thing that they're talking about here where it's not per shape it's for all shapes so basically one model for everything uh, neural surface reconstruction method so they're going to be using a neural net and then surface reconstruction just it tries to reconstruct a surface the surface here is the uh, boundary of the, of the SDF proposed several critical training strategies to enable the reconstruction of a 360 degree mesh again they keep using this 360 degree mesh but that that's not like a thing <laughs> you know it's like any any 3d mesh is 360 degrees uh, without costly optimization our method reconstructs 3d shapes in significantly less time than existing methods moreover our method favors better geometry generates more 3d consistent results and adheres more closely to the input image uh, None of these are like very formal quantitative kind of results here. These are just kind of very subjective here. Better geometry, more consistent, more closely. So we'll see if they actually do any quantitative comparisons to other techniques. But it's kind of hard in this space. There's a lot of different types of methods that are kind of apples and oranges, hard to compare. So we'll see what they compare to. Uh, we evaluate our approach on both synthetic data and in the wild images so they're going to be comparing to synthetic data sets which are very popular in these kind of 2d to 3d because uh, you can take any 3d any kind of like random mesh that you have sitting around and then you can basically generate a picture from it and because you know the ground truth you know the exact mesh that uh, produced that image you can then compare what you reconstruct with what the actual uh, mesh is uh, okay. Uh, supported by integrating with off-the-shelf text image diffusion models. Okay, and then I guess because you're using a diffusion model, you can also not only condition on the view, but then also condition on some kind of text, and then in that way get a text-to-image uh, 3D model. Or text-to-3D model. All right, so pretty cool. This definitely has me excited to read the rest of this paper. Let me take a little sip of my yerba mate here. All right, introduction. Single image 3D reconstruction. The task of reconstructing a 3D model of an object from a single 2D image is a long-standing problem in the computer vision community and is crucial for a wide range of applications such as robotic object manipulation and navigation, 3D content creation, as well as AR and VR. Uh, hello, Madi. How's it going? Uh, the problem is challenging as it requires not only the reconstruction of visible parts, but also the hallucination of invisible regions. Yeah, so one of the problems with 3D reconstruction is filling in these empty areas, right? So especially when you look at meshes, it can get very difficult such as uh, what is the underneath of this hamburger or what does it look like underneath Mario's armpit here there's areas that basically you don't have a view of them at all in the 2d uh, view that you're given so the model itself has to kind of hallucinate what that surface looks like in those weird hidden areas and you can end up with weird holes or, or weird uh, kind of like uh, textures and looking things like that so that's always been an issue this problem is often ill-posed and corresponds to multiple plausible solutions because of insufficient evidence from the single image. Humans can adeptly infer 3D content based on our extensive knowledge of the world. Humans have a very strong visual prior, right? We can basically see 3D even if we only have one eye, so we don't even need our stereo eyes to, to see 3D. We can basically, even just one with one eyeball we can have an, we know exactly kind of how 3D objects are going to look and, and the depth and roughly like that because we have such a good prior uh, of the 3D world just from millions of years of evolution. Uh, to endow intelligent agents with this ability many existing methods exploit class specific priors by training 3D generative networks on 3D shape data sets. 
yeah, so here what they're saying is that there's other techniques that try to do this uh, 2D to 3D, but they are training on some kind of explicit 3D shape data set that maybe has uh, specific cl classes. Um, I think that this is what the point E, which is the OpenAI uh, 3D object generation work does. I'm not 100% sure anymore. But I think shape E also does use a 3D data set. I don't recall anymore. They might just use clip. Okay, if one of you guys actually knows whether or not shape E uses a 3D shape data set, let it know in the chat. These methods often fail to generalize to unseen categories and the reconstruction quality is constrained by the limited size of public 3D data sets. Yeah, and also another thing with 3D data sets is like if you think cleaning text data is annoying and difficult and time consuming, cleaning 3D asset data set is a whole other level. And it's also uh, more difficult to scrape, right? It's like images are somewhat easy to get from the internet. You can kind of scrape them and it's fine. They generally tend to be more consistent. They're almost always RGB images and you can kind of clean them quite automatically, right? But if you go to uh, something like a Sketchfab, right? Which is a giant database effectively of 3D objects, right? The the um, difference in these objects and in, in terms of just like the file formats and uh, like, for example, you see here this, this random uh, look and alligator thing. Um, 33,000 triangles, 18,000 vertices, but the file format of this little alligator thing, very different from probably whatever the file format is for this, this little Gandhi model here, right? So it's a huge variety of different formats. And then it's also the ownership is really weird because sometimes some of these are CC attribution non-commercial, but then you have other ones that you don't even know where they're coming from. So I don't know, TLDR is that 3D data sets are a huge pain to clean and to collect and to put them in some kind of standard format so that you can train uh, some kind of learning based method on them. Uh, hello there, Gattaca. Are you going to implement machine learning methods from scratch or use some ready-made ones? Uh, I am going to read a paper. So <laughs> I'm not implementing anything. Uh, I am just reading this paper. But I do have coding streams. If you're more interested in kind of uh, writing code, uh, check out some of the coding streams. Generally, I don't implement things from scratch. At this point, deep learning has gotten so compute heavy that training anything from scratch is basically impossible uh, as an individual person. The best you can really do is take an already existing uh, model and then maybe fine tune it a little bit or uh, transfer it to your own task. But I don't know, in 2023, unless you have a, a shit ton of GPUs and money, you're basically almost never training anything from scratch. Uh, okay, in this work, we produce a generic solution to turn any, any an image of any object, regardless of its category, into a high-quality 3D textured mesh. Okay, high-quality, again, here doesn't mean anything. So they keep adding these adjectives to mesh but these adjectives don't have any meaning. 360 degree mesh doesn't mean anything. High quality mesh doesn't mean anything. They're just kind of like meaningless adjectives here. We propose a novel approach that can effectively use the strong priors learned by 2D diffusion models. So what they're saying here is that a 2D diffusion model such as clip or stable diffusion has seen so many images of the real world that it has some kind of prior about the real world, right? It kind of knows what the underneath of a barrel looks like because in its in in its training it's seen potentially images of the underneath of a barrel right so it has some intuition about what the underneath of this barrel could look like so we want to use those priors that that diffusion model has a prior is just a assumption about how the work worlds right it's like uh it literally refers to the concept of a prior distribution when you're when you're saying okay well i have some but the way that people use it 
most of the time is in a more broad definition where a prior is basically what assumption am I making about this problem and how can I encode that assumption in some kind of constraint that then allows uh, an optimization process to arrive to a final solution faster. Uh, I was just wondering, you're right about implementing methods. Sorry to distract you. No problem, man. I'm happy for distractions, you know. I want I want people to feel like they can ask questions and they, they don't need to be afraid of stupid questions because I ask stupid questions all the time. Okay, recent 2D generative models such as DALI, ImageGen, and Stable Diffusion. Uh, a new Stable Diffusion model actually just came out. I've been playing with it, so... That might actually be the subject of our next coding stream is uh, Stable Diffusion XL, which just came out. Uh, ImageGen is Google's, which is you can't really use, and Dolly is OpenAI's stable or er, diffusion model. So Dolly and ImageGen are basically closed source black box. Uh, Clip is also is actually it's actually not a diffusion model. Clip is a Contrastive language image pre-training, which is basically a the reason people use it is because it allows you to go from text into images and images into text. It basically has a shared uh, latent space for image and uh, language, so it's very very popular for any kind of generative uh, model. Have made significant strides by pre-training on internet scale image data sets since they learn a wide range of visual concepts and possess strong priors about our 3D world. It is natural to marry 3D tasks with them. An emerging body of research has employed 2D diffusion models or vision language models to assist in 3D generative tasks. The common paradigm is to perform per shape optimization with differentiable rendering and then the guidance of the clip model or 2D diffusion models. Yeah. So this is kind of the approaches that we keep seeing again and again. And there's a bunch of different uh, 3D generative papers that we've read uh, in this channel and pretty much all of them have some variant of this where they're basically just using clip and then doing some kind of per shape optimization maybe generating different sides of it SDFs are also very popular as well uh, neural fields are the most commonly used representation yeah uh, although these optimization based methods have achieved impressive results they face some common dilemmas they're time consuming Per shape optimization typically involves tens of thousands of iterations of full image volume rendering and prior model inferences, resulting in typically tens of minutes per shapes. Yeah, it's very annoying to have to do that, right? Imagine if you had to basically spend 10 minutes generating a single shape. Eventually, you want to get to a point where you can generate hundreds of shapes in fractions of a second, right? If you envision a future where we're generating objects inside like a video game at runtime, we need to go beyond this idea of per shape optimization. Uh, memory intensive. The full image is required for the 2D prior. Volume rendering can be memory intensive. Sure. I mean, it goes hand in hand with the fact that you're doing per shape optimization. And then 3D inconsistent. Since 2D prior model only sees a single view at each iteration and tries to make each view look like the input, they often generate 3D inconsistent shapes. The Yanis problem. So the Yanis problem is whenever, uh, let's say you were trying to generate the face of this Mario, and then you flip the Mario around, and much like Voldemort, he has a face on the back of his head, right? So that's the, the Yanis problem, is whenever you have the face on the front and the back like this, right? And the reason that this happens is because of the priors, right? So these diffusion models have a prior where if they see a neck and they see a body, they want to put a face on it, right? And it's very rare to see the back of someone's head in a picture. So more often than not, if you generate a face on top of a body, you're doing the right thing. So the problem with that is that as you rotate the body, the diffusion model is going to want to just generate another face on there, right? Because it it's more it's it's hasn't seen that many backs of someone's head, right? So this kind of this is a problem because of the priors of these uh, models that pretty much most of the time you're seeing the front of someone's face and not the back of someone's face. So they generate faces when there aren't faces. Uh, many methods use the density field as the representation in volume rendering. It's common that they picture good RGB renderings, but extracting high quality mesh tends to be difficult. 
Uh, so the density field refers to the fact that uh, when you're using a nerf or a neural radiance field, often you're also you're predicting not just the color at every single point in space, but you're also predicting some usually the density at every single point in space. And then you can threshold that density and say, okay, well, where in this 3D uh, space is there basically this large spike in density? And I'm going to assume that that is the surface of my object. Uh, am I going to pull up the nerf? I'm going to pull up the nerf. Nerf uh, computer vision. So here we go. This is the the world famous nerf picture here. Open image in new tab. Picture's worth a thousand words. A neural radiance field is a field which is basically just a function that you can query at every single point inside this voxel, which is this 3D space here, this square. And uh, for every point here, you're querying, right, X, Y, Z. You're saying, okay, I'm X, Y, Z, and I'm looking at this X, Y, Z from this view angle theta and phi, and you have this little neural net here, right? That's the, whole, that's the neural part of the nerf, and the neural net will tell you, okay, at that point in this 3D space, this is the color, RGB, and then this is the uh, sigma uh, called the opacity in the original paper, but... You could also think of this as kind of the density, right? Where it's basically like how see-through is uh, this point here. So this neural net is implicitly uh, encoding the entire object inside this volume of space. Uh, instead of following the common optimization paradigm, we propose a novel approach to utilize 2D prior models for 3D modeling. At the heart of our approach is the combination of a 2D diffusion model with a cost volume based 3D reconstruction technique. Okay, we'll see what this is. Enabling the reconstruction of a high quality 360 degree textured mesh from a single image in a feed forward pass without per scene optimization. Okay. So you're getting the mesh, but not only is it a mesh, it's also a textured mesh, which means it has that color, right? Uh, and you're not doing a per shape optimization here. They're calling it per scene optimization. Uh, sh scene and shape can mean slightly different things, right? So when people refer to a scene, generally they refer to like, maybe like something that you would see in robotics or autonomous vehicles, right? There's multiple objects, there's a floor, but uh, in the context of this paper, scene and shape are basically the same, right? Because if you look at all their examples, pretty much every single one of their examples just looks like a shape, right? The, none of these are scenes, these are all shapes. If this was a scene, then you would also get the object here. You would also get the floor, and you would get the background, and you would get all these other things, right? Here, for example, this moped. If we were doing scene reconstruction, we would also reconstruct the back wall and the cobblestone uh, road and then the doorway, but that's not what's happening at all here, right? What it's reconstructing is a single shape. It's reconstructing only the moped. Uh, specifically, we leverage 2D diffusion models, 0, 1, 2, 3. I bet you this is... Adobe's diffusion model. Uh, zero, one, two, three. Let's see. Let's copy that. Interesting. So this is not Adobe's model. I think we also did read this paper. This is uh, Columbia University and Toyota Research Institute. Huh. That's kind of a weird one, right? you would have thought that they would have used a diffusion model that comes out of Adobe or one of these other institutions, but the diffusion model that they're using is actually coming out of completely different institutions, which is weird. It's a little, little oddity there for sure. Okay. Uh, which is fine-tuned on stable diffusion to predict novel views of input images given the camera transformation. Okay, so I guess maybe 0, 1, 2, 3 is basically just stable diffusion. It's kind of like a distilled version of stable diffusion, if I had to guess. Utilize it to generate multi-view predictions of the input single image so that we can leverage multi-view 3D reconstruction to obtain a 3D mesh. There are two challenges associated with reconstruction from synthesized multi-view predictions. Inherent lack of perfect consistency with the multi-view predictions which can lead to severe failures in optimization-based methods, such as nerf methods. I don't know what they mean by consistency here. I guess they mean uh, 
the mesh itself is low quality. I don't know. The camera pose of the input image is required but unknown. Yeah, so this is a big one too. So uh, when you create a nerf, right, a neural radiance field, you have to know this theta here and this phi, right? And those that theta and that phi are basically the, the view angle. It's like where am I seeing this point from, right? Because if I look at this point from here, it's different than if I look at this point from here, right? But in order to know that theta and that phi, you basically need to know the exact position of this camera. And unless you are uh, in some kind of robotics use case where you know the exact position of the robot, it's very difficult to get that exact position of the camera. And generally what people resort to is uh, a technique known as Colmap, which is an old school computer vision technique that'll basically, given a bunch of pictures, right, it'll give you the... Uh, it'll give you the position of the camera for each of those pictures. But this is it's this is a completely separate optimization process. So if you took a video with your cell phone, you would then have to run it through Colmap to produce a bunch of pictures with corresponding camera positions, and then you could use that in order to make a nerf. So this need for explicit camera position is kind of a huge pain uh, when it comes to nerfs. We build our reconstruction module upon a cost volume based neural reconstru surface reconstruction approach, sparse noose, sparse neural surface. I feel like we've read this paper, I don't exactly remember anymore, which is a variant of MVS nerf. Maybe not. Additionally, we introduce a series of essential training strategies that enable the reconstruction of 360 degree meshes from inc inherently inconsistent multi view predictions. Say that fast inherently inconsistent. We also propose an elevation estimation module that estimates the elevation of the input shape in 0123's canonical coordinate system. Elevation estimation module, I guess that's just the Z height, so how high is the object? Uh, which is used to compute the camera poses required by the reconstruction module. Okay, so they're basically doing some kind of estimation of the camera pose. By integrating the three modules of multi-view synthesis, elevation estimation, and 3D reconstruction, our method can reconstruct 3D meshes of any object from a single image in a feed-forward manner. Yeah, so this is kind of where the over-engineering is coming from, right? Where when we were looking at this page, we looked at this uh, diagram here, and it looks like there's a lot of different pieces, and uh, we're starting to see what e each of these different pieces are. Without costly optimizations, our method reconstructs 3D shapes in less time, aka 45 seconds. But we don't know what hardware that's running on, so uh, favors better geometry to the due to the use of the sine distance function representation, generates more consistent 3D meshes, thanks to camera conditioned multi view predictions. So you're predicting on multiple views and you're conditioning on the camera position, I guess. Or I guess maybe just camera height. Moreover, our reconstruction adheres more closely to the input image compared to existing methods. We evaluate our method on both synthetic data and real images and demonstrate that our method outperforms existing methods in both quality and efficiency. Uh, maybe they do a user study. That's kind of the gold standard here for determining the quality of generated uh, objects and generated images, but I don't know, they haven't mentioned it, so hopefully they're using a user study. Uh, 3D generation guided by 2D prior models. Here you have their related work section where they're basically just going to reference pretty much every single paper that they can. Uh, of course, prioritizing the papers from their own research group, right? This is where you want to pump those citation numbers. Okay, so let's see. Uh, you got DALI, ImageGen, Stable Diffusion, Clip. Uh, powerful priors, of course. Dreamfield, Dream Fusion, Magic 3D, blah blah blah, Nerf. So here's a bunch of different 3D representations: Nerfs, meshes, SM, simple human model. This is uh, common for pose uh, detection and optimization. SMPL. If you ever see those like kind of like creepy looking uh, 3D humans, that's what these are. SMPL uh, pose detection. 
yeah these guys these like kind of like weird like this is like the generic human uh mesh that is used and it's, it's that's what the smpl is is basically this format sometimes you see it in in uh these these are basically key points and then this is a skeleton and then this is the smpl mesh uh but those are basically priors right different types of 3d representation which come with different priors uh 2d diffusion 3d shape generation <laughs> some works leverage the embedding space of clip i would say that's extremely popular you see that in a lot of papers and some work focus on generating textures for input meshes using the 2D models prior. Before the emergence of CLIP, large-scale 2D diffusion models, people often learn 3D priors from synthetic data or real scans. So, blah, 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 3D generation, 3D data in various representation, including voxels. Uh, voxels are kind of like a point cloud, right? A point cloud is a collection of individual points and you can have a colored point cloud where each point has a color um voxels are rather than a specific point in a specific 3d uh position in space a voxel also has a specific size right so this is what a voxel looks like and anytime you see that word voxel in your head just think minecraft right it's that kind of like blocky appearance where it's not only just a position in 3D space, but there's also basically some size to it. And there's fancy ways of uh, storing voxels in 3D space. The most famous of these being an octree. Yeah, an octree is basically a tree-based uh, data structure that represents uh, positions in 3D space along with a specific size, right? So these are this is a very popular uh, 3D file format for uh, point clouds, uh, polygon meshes. That's just a mesh and parametric models. This is your assigned distance function, or you could have 3D objects that have specific. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into that. Parametric modeling is like a whole way of creating 3D assets where basically you define specific uh, sizes such as, hey, this radius is this size, this uh, arm is this length, and then you can change the values of those. I think uh, Houdini is a very popular Houdini parametric modeling. Yeah, this is uh, a way of generating 3D shapes from a set of parameters but I'm going a little bit too deep in the rabbit hole there okay as previously mentioned several recent works leverage 2d diffusion models to perform per shape allowing for the text to 3d task diffusion models are typically conditioned on text that's where the whole text to image comes from Uh, neural lift adds a clip loss to enforce similarity between the rendered image and the input image. Fine tunes the stable diffusion model with LoRa layers, low rank adaptation, everybody's favorite way of fine tuning. Uh, recent work fine tunes the stable diffusion model, get a novel view. They're referencing the OpenAI point E work here, which we've read those papers as well. If you're interested in that, those are kind of a cool. Uh, cool series of papers. There's point E, and then I think the one after that is called shape E. Uh, generalizable neural reconstruction. Traditional NERF use a neural network to represent a single scene and require per scene optimization. Some approaches aim to learn priors across scenes and generalize to novel scenes. Yeah, you really don't want to be doing this per scene or per shape. So if you can figure out some way to generalize and do it uh, for all scenes and all shapes, that's going to be huge. So that's kind of what they're advertising in this paper. Pixel feature. Okay, these methods typically take a few source views and leverage 2D networks for extracting 2D features. 
The pixel features are then unprojected into 3D space and the nerf based rendering pipeline is applied on top of them. In this way they can generate a 3D implicit field given a few source views and a single feed forward pass. Uh, directly aggregate 2D features with MLPs or transformers. Uh, Transformer is a neural network architecture. MLP is also a neural network architecture. MLP is like the simplest possible neural network architecture. It's just a couple layers, right? Also sometimes called a fully connected uh, neural network. A transformer is obviously much more complicated, but uh, much more powerful and scalable than an MLP. Uh, utilize the voxel feature for decoding density and color. In addition to density field representations, some methods such as sparse noose and vol recon utilize SDF representations for geometry reconstruction. Yeah, SDF is also popular. I think a bunch of other papers also use SDFs. Okay, so here we go. Figure two. Our method consists of three primary components. You got the multi-view synthesis. We use a view-conditioned 2D diffusion model. So where is the diffusion model? I can, don't see it anywhere. There's a bunch of different models here. I think maybe this is the model. Zero, one, two, three. Yeah, okay, so I think this is the the 2D diffusion model, 0, 1, 2, 3. See, it's this little bubble here that says 0, 1, 2, 3. But you see this little uh, ice right there? That means it's frozen. And what that means is that they're not pushing gradients into it, right? They just went to the GitHub repo for this 0, 1, 2, 3, and they took the pre-trained model and they froze it and they're just going to use it as is, right? So they're not pushing any additional gradients into this 2D diffusion model here and they're using it at a variety of different points here. So you can see how this diffusion model is uh, conditioned on an image. So you have an arrow going in here that has the image, right? But it's also conditioned on the uh, view and the view can take, you can give it the poses or here 360 degree poses but all of these are poses which are also views, right? A view is a pose. A view is just kind of where you're viewing it from. A pose is generally refers to a six dimensional um, position. To generate multi-view images, let me zoom in a little bit more here. Uh, single image and a relative camera transformation which is parameterized by the relative spherical coordinates. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. They're using uh, spherical coordinates here, not uh, Cartesian coordinates, uh, theta, phi, and r. So in spherical coordinates, you have r is the radius, and then theta and phi are basically the uh, kind of the yaw and then the pitch, right? And I think that if you actually look at the original Nerf paper, this is the same spherical coordinates here, right? Theta and phi, right? But in the Nerf paper, they don't need the R, the radius, because the camera is kind of like a... You, it doesn't matter if the camera's like right next to the thing or a million miles away from the thing. That is not uh, one of the variables that determines the appearance. Okay, so I think when they're talking about these poses here, the view conditioned Right? When they're conditioning this diffusion model on what they're calling views here, what they really mean is uh, a spherical coordinate here, which is what I think this delta pose means. Uh, we estimate the elevation angle theta, so that's this part of the spherical coordinate, delta theta, elevation angle, of the input image based on four nearby views generated by 0, 1, 2, 3. We then obtain the poses of the multi-view images by combining the specified relative poses with the estimated pose of the input view. Okay, so this is the S S elevation estimation module, right? And the purpose of this model is that it takes a bunch of pictures and it'll guess what this uh, elevation is, this theta, right? This one little part of this spherical coordinates. So that's what they're doing here in this pose estimation step. Alright, and then the last step, 3D reconstruction, we feed the multi-view posed images to an SDF-based generalizable neural surface reconstruction module for the 360 degree mesh reconstruction. Uh, so that's what I think this is here. This MLP and this MLP. What are 
of the different things that are going on here. So you have your theta. This is your guess as to the elevation of the camera. Here you're using the diffusion model to generate views. And then for each of those views, it seems like you generate even more views. So you use the input image to generate n views, and then you use each of those views to generate more views, so four times n views. Right, so you see here now you've gone from basically one input image to four times n, I don't know how many this is, maybe like 12, 20, probably no more than 100 different views. And then those views are, you see this little line going over here, those views are used along with the camera pose, are fed into this multi-layer perceptron here, and that gives you a RGB, a single color per point, probably. Right, the way that they're they have these voxels here. Here's where you're actually getting the nerf, I guess. And then you also have an MLP that predicts the value of the sine distance function. And then from that sine distance function, you can basically get a uh, estimate for the opacity or the uh, density. And then if you have a color, if you have a uh, field that represents the color, which is what's coming out of this MLP, and then you have a field that represents the density, which is coming out of this MLP here, then you can now uh, actually generate the mesh with a classic marching cubes algorithm here. And here I think are the losses, so this is actually where the, f the losses come from. So your losses are going to go all the way from here and they're going to be pushing all the way back and they're going to push into these this MLP and this MLP and then also this uh, elevation estimation module here. And it looks like there's two losses here. You have an RGB loss, which compares the pixels, the RGB color value for each pixel to the ground truth RGB color pack value for that pixel. And then you have the depth loss, which I guess uh, compares the depth at each pixel to the ground truth depth at each pixel. So ground truth RGB and ground truth depth to me means that they have to have a 3D data set. So that's not looking good because they literally said that they don't use a... They don't use public 3D data sets, but then it seems like based on these losses that they're going to have to use some kind of 3D uh, data because here ground truth RGB and ground truth depth, those are coming from some kind of actual mesh that you know for a fact represents this object. So we'll see exactly what what they're doing there. That's that's a little ominous for sure. Okay. Method. So here's where they're the section where they're actually going to describe uh, the technique that they're doing. It's basically going to be the text version of this figure here. Uh, we introduce a view condition 3D diffusion, 2D diffusion model, which is used to generate multi-view images. We show that traditional NERF-based and SDF-based SDF methods fail to construct high-quality meshes from inconsistent multi-view predictions, even given ground truth camera poses. Therefore, in section 3.3, we propose a cost-volume-based neural surface reconstruction module that can be trained to handle inconsistent multi-view predictions and reconstruct a 3D mesh in a single feed-forward pass. So I don't know what the cost here means, right? So there's there's something going on here. There's some cost. Cost just means that there's some part of the loss, basically, that penalizes something. But we'll see exactly if they give us the formula that tells us what exactly that cost is. Introduce several critical training strategies. We demonstrate the necessity of estimating the pose of the input view in 0123's canonical space for 3D reconstruction. Estimating the pose of the input view, I think what they literally mean here is the elevation, elevation of input view. Uh, while the azimuth and radius can be arbitrarily specified, the azimuth and the radius are the other parts here. So the elevation is the theta, the azimuth is this phi, and then the radius is this r, and those are the three parts of a spherical coordinate. Uh, we propose a novel module that utilizes four nearby views to estimate the elevation of the input view. Yeah, so four nearby views, that's where this 4x is coming here. So for each 
view you're generating four nearby views. So it's probably for this view, you generate kind of one that's slightly to the slightly higher in theta, slightly lower in theta, slightly higher in uh, azimuth, slightly lower in azimuth, and then I guess they don't do slightly closer in R and slightly further away in R. Uh, okay, have demonstrated the ability to learn a wide range of visual concepts and strong priors. Yeah, you really want to be leveraging the uh, priors of these giant diffusion models. While the original diffusion models focus on the tax, recent work has shown that fine-tuning pre-trained models allows us to add various conditional controls to the diffusion models and generate images based on specific conditions. Yeah, pretty much anything and everything that can be used to condition a diffusion model has been used to condition a diffusion model at this point. Uh, several conditions such as canny edges, user scribbles, depth, and normal maps have already proven effective. The canny edges, depth, uh, normal maps, this is a control net, is what they're referencing here. Uh, the recent work, 0123, shares a similar spirit and aims to add viewpoint condition control for the stable diffusion model. So, they're going to be conditioning on the viewpoint. Specifically, given a single RGB image of an object in a relative camera transformation in uh, spherical coordinates, 0123 aims to control the diffusion model to synthesize a new image under this transformed camera view. Okay, so that's basically what's happening here, right? Is that you take this image and you're conditioning this diffusion model on the image, but then also four slight uh, delta poses, right? And the delta there refers to the fact that you're saying, you're not saying generate the image for me at a 180 degree view, right? You're saying generate the image of this but plus one degree in this angle so it's not like a absolute camera tra camera position it's a relative camera position and I think that part is important right because if you were to do an absolute camera position then uh, the orientation of the object you would be kind of inserting a prior into that that you won't want right but the relative camera transformation I think that that removes this kind of like prior that assumes a specific orientation for the object itself. So I think the fact that it's relative is actually quite clever and good there. Uh, during the creation, 0123 assumes that the object is centered at the origin of the coordinate system. So this is a uh, kind of pretty generic prior that people use is that much like you have an object-centric prior in images where almost always the camera, anytime you find a picture on the internet, it's almost always uh, there's an object that's centered in the 2D image. You can kind of do the same thing with 3D. You can have this object-centric prior in a 3D uh, volume where you say, okay, there's probably going to be something in the center of this that is a single object that has this kind of mesh that is uh, concave all around it. Uh, the camera is placed on the sphere surface and always looks at the origin. From two for two camera poses, theta one, phi one, and r one, and theta two, phi two, and r two, where theta i, phi i, and r i denote the polar angle, azimuth angle, and radius. The relative camera pra transformation is parameterized as that. Okay, so the relative this delta uh, pose, which is what they're here. Whenever they say delta pose, really what they mean is basically this. It's the difference between each of the uh, coordinates in the spherical coordinate uh, frame. They aim to new, learn a new model, F. So F here is the uh, diffusion model. And you're conditioning the diffusion model on X, which are the image. And then you're conditioning it on the difference of each of the, the pose difference here x1 and x2 are two images of an object captured from different views. Alright, figure four, what do we got here? We analyze the prediction quality by comparing its predictions to ground truth renderings across various view transformations. For each view transformation, we report the average PSNR mask IOU. Uh, mask IOU is inter in, uh, a mask is basically a an image that just has 
two possible values and picture worth a thousand words mask computer vision right it's basically telling you what is the object and then what is the background none of these this is a mask right so this is telling you this is the hand and then this is the background so mask IOU is the intersection of two masks and obviously the more accurate your 3d object is from any view the more accurate the mask is going to be so that's why mask IOU is a way to determine kind of the quality of the actual 3d shape that you've generated clip similarity is I don't like this method as much but basically how you would use clip similarity is saying okay I'm gonna take the picture of this object from this view and I'm gonna feed it into clip and it's gonna give me a little uh, vector an embedding that represents that object and then I'm gonna feed uh, a different picture of that same object from a different view put that into clip and it'll generate a little embedding and then I'm gonna compare that embedding to the first embedding and if they're close together that means that my object is consistent semantically across all the different views but the reason I don't like this is that if I take a picture of a front of a human the clip vector is gonna have some kind of semantic knowledge of like this is the front of a human with a person's face right but if I take a picture from the back of a human the clip vector is not gonna have that right it's not gonna have the concept of a face in it. it might only have the concept of a human and then if I take those two embedding vectors and I look at the similarity between them it might seem like I have a low similarity because one of these vectors is trying to represent a human with a face and the other one is trying to represent just a human from the back right so clip similarity assumes this kind of like 360 degree symmetry which works if it's like a flower vase or something that is like rotationally symmetric but I think clip similarity can be misleading uh, if the object doesn't have rotational symmetry and it's actually the reason you get the Yanis problem right in a lot of these 3d reconstruction methods is because they're using something like clip similarity uh, okay and this is the actual data set that they're using here objaverse <laughs> what a name objaverse is a 2022 data set Let me scroll back up here. Uh, okay, the prediction mask is calculated by considering foreground objects. 0, 1, 2, 3 provides more accurate predictions when the view transformation is small. Okay, so we have tensor RF noose. These are two different uh, other papers, other techniques. Uh, Tensor RF is supposed to represent uh, nerf based methods and noose, na, neural S, nurse, nu, nus, nus. I don't know how you say this, but it's neural SDF. Uh, that's supposed to be representative of the SDF based methods. Fails to reconstruct high quality images. Okay, so obviously this looks absolutely terrible here from Tensor RF. Also relatively terrible from noose here. azimuth delta azimuth so this is the relative uh the difference between two positions so obviously the highest you can go is 180 degrees so delta azimuth of 180 degrees basically means the front of an object and then the back of an object and this is yeah, actually here you go this is exactly what i was talking about here so you see here the clip similarity you see how there's more similarity with there's kind of a pattern here you see how the front of the barrel kind of looks like the back of the barrel and the and the side of the barrel kind of looks like the other side of the barrel so there's there's kind of this weird pattern here where the clip similarity between this which maybe is the front of the barrel has a higher similarity with this part here which is maybe the other side of the barrel compared to this other random angle so the symmetry of an object ends up being very important and gives you this kind of weird pattern when you're actually looking at the clip similarity between different pictures at different angles so this is like the Yanis problem in visual form right here uh, okay 
but basically they're showing you how these techniques suck, right? At the end of the day, if you're writing a paper, you want to basically talk shit on everybody else's techniques and then uh, talk about how your technique is the best and how it's going to make it all good. So here they're just showing you how nerf-based methods and SDF-based methods have pitfalls. All right, can nerf optimization lift multi-view predictions to 3D? Uh, lift here is just... There isn't like a formal definition for this. Lifting is just this idea of like taking a 2D thing and lifting it into 3D, right? But there's like a million different ways of doing that. So uh, given a single image of an object, we can utilize 0, 1, 2, 3 to generate multi-view images, but can we use traditional NERF-based or SDF-based methods to reconstruct high-quality 3D meshes for these predictions? We conduct a small experiment. Given a single image, we generate 32 multi-view images using seeing 0, 1, 2, 3 with camera poses uniformly sampled from the sphere surface. So this is key, right? It's basically they're uniformly sampling camera poses around the object, right? Which is in itself a prior because it means that no view angle of this object is more important than any other view angle, right? Versus you could actually see a world where uniformly sampling camera poses is actually not what you want to do because there's probably more detail, right? So like, let's say you had a 3D object that was like a painting or something, right? You would probably, like this, for example, yeah, this is a good one. So this is like some kind of clock, but the the details are all in the front of the object, right? So you would want to sample more camera poses that are here in the front of the object then you would sample camera poses here, right? Because the back of the object is maybe featureless. It just kind of looks like flat. So uniformly sampling camera poses in a 360 degree uh, sphere around the object is in itself a kind of prior, which is something to think about. Okay, we then feed the predictions to a nerf-based method and an SDF-based method, which optimize density and SDF fields respectively. Uh, however, as shown, both methods both methods failed to produce satisfactory results, generating numerous distortions and floaters. This is primarily due to the inconsistency of 0, 1, 2, 3's predictions. I think floaters, what they're talking about here is when you look here, you see how some of the, there's like these weird little blobs of mesh here that are just floating in 3D space. Uh, compare with ground truth, PSNR is not very high. This is... Uh, peak signal to noise ratio. Uh, the mask IOU and clip similarity are relatively good. This suggests that 0123 tends to generate predictions that are perceptually similar to the ground truth and have similar contours or boundaries, but the pixel level appearance may not be exactly the same. Such inconsistencies between the source views are already fatal to traditional optimization-based methods. Although the original 0123 paper proposes another method for lifting its multi-view predictions, we will demonstrate in experiments and it also fails to yield perfect results and entails time-consuming optimization. Neural surface reconstruction. We base our reconstruction module on a generalizable SDF reconstruction method sparse noose, which is essentially a variant of MVS nerf. Uh, neural scene representation volume rendering takes multiple input source images with corresponding camera poses and generates a textured mesh in a single feed-forward pass. Eh, I mean, <laughs> it's not necessarily a single feed-forward pass, right? Like, that's important to realize, too, right? Is that the single feed-forward pass will generate this RGB and density information here but then you actually have to perform volume rendering to get the mesh. So it's not like you're getting the mesh directly out of the neural net, right? The, the mesh is coming as a result of this volume rendering, which takes some amount of compute and memory to do, right? But that's important to uh, note there that it's, it's not actually generating a textured mesh from the single feed forward pass. It's generating uh, a signal from which you can create the textured mesh using uh, volume or volume rendering techniques. Uh, we will briefly describe the network pipeline and explain how we train the module. 
uh, as shown in figure two, a reconstruction method takes m posed source images as input. Okay, so control Z, let's make sure we use our green color. So green is the color that we use for uh, math definitions. So anytime we're reading a paper and as soon as they define a uh, variable, you kind of want to take note of it, right? And if, if you see an equation, right? If a paper is well written, every time you see an equation, by the time you get to it, you should know what every single one of the variables in that equation means. And if you don't know what one of those variables in that equation means, just start looking back at what you already read and see if you can find the formal definition of that. So uh, here we're starting to, for example, we know that M, if we see it uh, at any point later in this paper, it means the uh, number of posed source images. Right, so here, input images, it just, it says input image, this is just one, but you could have M of these, is basically what they're saying. The module begins by extracting a M 2D feature maps using a 2D feature network. So a 2D feature network is any, uh, it's probably a, a convolutional neural net, but a convolutional neural net will take your image, right? And let's pull up convolutional neural net. So, uh, here we go. Actually, this is better. I like this kind of weird 3D. So, it takes an image, and then you have these series of convolution operations, and it produces uh, these features, right? So, sometimes when people refer to features, they're referring to flat features, so a, a, a big vector, right, that or an embedding, right? It's basically just a one-dimensional uh, vector that represents this picture. But here, they're saying 2D features, right? And 2D feature maps. So what that means is that they're not, they're not using the flattened features that comes out of that. What they're using is the 2D ones. So like uh, this right here, right? So right before it gets converted into a flattened, you have a 2D feature map. It's actually more than that because there's a bunch of channel dimensions, right? The original image has three channel dimensions, but by the time you get to these 2D feature maps, there's more probably like, for example, here, 16 feature maps here in this uh, MNIST. MNIST is the data set here. But you see here the feature maps are five by five and then there's 16 of them. So they're taking each of those views, each of those images of this object, and then they're converting it into M 2D feature maps using some kind of ConvNet, if I had to guess. Next, the module builds a 3D cost volume whose contents are computed by first projecting each 3D voxel into M 2D feature planes and then fetching the variance of the features across the M projected 2D locations. Okay, this is a little bit more complicated here. So, projecting each 3D voxel to M 2D feature planes. So, I think that's this step here, right? So. There's some volume here. This is a voxel, right? A volume is some bounded region of 3D space, and then a voxel is an individual little subsection of that bounded region of 3D space. And it seems like each voxel has some kind of cost, right? So maybe the things in the center of the volume have a low cost, and the things in the outside have a high cost. We don't exactly know what the cost is just yet. But then you have a 3D convolution, 3D conv here, and uh, 3D conv is basically just a 2D convolution. It's the same thing, except now you're also doing it in 3D, so rather than just kind of uh, striding from left to right and up to down across a 2D image, now you're doing it basically across a 3D volume, but it's the same idea. And what exactly are they doing here? They're projecting each 3D voxel to 2D feature planes and then fetching the variance of the features across the M projected 2D locations. So variance is uh, variance Gaussian, right? Whenever you see variance in your head, think about a Gaussian distribution. And a Gaussian distribution is parameterized by two values. It's parameterized by the mean, which is the center here, right? Where is this centered, right? So obviously here, the blue, red, and or and whatever this is, brown things are centered on zero. The mean is zero. But then you see here the sigma squared. This is sometimes also called the this is called the variance. 
but you see here how if you change the variance, the spread becomes wider. So something that is high variance has a very wide kind of spread, lots of possible values, right? Something with a low variance, very narrow, right? It's almost always the same value. So here, they're looking for the variance of the features. So basically, if those features represent kind of what is happening inside that 3D voxel, if there's a high variance of features, that means that as you're going from one voxel to the next voxel to the next voxel, the content of what's inside that voxel is changing a lot, right? Versus if the features are kind of the same across each of those voxels, the variance is low, that means that the whatever is in that voxel is consistent with whatever is in the voxel next to it and so on. Let me blow my nose real quick. <clears throat> okay, uh, the cost volume is then processed using a sparse 3D CNN to obtain a geometry volume that encodes the underlying geometry of the input shape. So I guess this is the sparse 3D CNN. Okay, so the cost, okay, actually I think I'm starting to get this. So the cost is the variance of the features for each 3D voxel. And then you use a sparse 3D ConvNet to turn that into basically some kind of pseudo uh, density kind of thing, right? They're calling it here geometry volume, but it's basically some notion of like, there's an object here and this is kind of what the object is here in this volume or in this voxel. And here there is a, maybe less of a chance of an object and this is what's in this uh, voxel and so on. So it's basically like each little voxel is encoding some information about like what is the density and the kind of semantic meaning of like what whatever the hell is inside that little voxel. And that's what this... Uh, MLP here is using to create this uh, signed distance function, which is defined over the whole volume. To predict the SDF at an arbitrary point, an MLP network takes the 3D coordinate and its corresponding interpolated features from the geometry encoding volume as input. So this little MLP here is predicting a signed distance function, which you can query at an arbitrary 3D point. And it's trying, and it's also taking in this geometry encoding volume. So I think this is like, why is this more general, right? In my head, I'm thinking, isn't this going to be specific to each shape? To predict the color of a 3D point, another MLP network takes as input the 2D features and the projected locations, interpolated features, and then viewing direction of the query ray relative to the viewing direction of the source images. So the viewing direction of the query ray is uh, this, right? So this is the query ray, this red line that goes here. So the query is like, I want to know what this 3D shape looks like from this position, and that's the query position. And then the query ray is the is the ray, or basically it's just a, a word for a vector, right? A line that goes out, and a, a ray is basically you could think of it like an infinite vector that goes out infinitely in that direction. But it go, it passes through a specific pixel, and then it passes through the whole volume. The network predicts the blending weights for each source view and the color of the 3D point is predicted as the weighted sum of its projected colors. So this is the uh, neural or ray marching here where basically when you're doing a nerf, right, for each pixel, you're going to have a single ray that goes through that pixel, but that ray is going to intersect your volume at a variety of points, right? infinite number of points. You're actually going to sample a bunch of points along that ray that are inside your volume, and you're going to get the color at each of those points as well as the density or the opacity. And then you basically add those together, right? Kind of like you would take a bunch of transparent, semi-transparent like uh, projector slides and kind of all put them on top of each other, and in that way get the final color value for the pixel in the 2D image that you want. That's basically how nerfs work. 
Uh, and finally, an SDF-based rendering technique is applied on top of the two MLP networks for RGB and depth rendering. Okay. Depth and RGB rendering, both of these are going to produce a... Uh, RGB is going to be a 2D image. Depth is also going to be a 2D image. And you're going to have to apply an additional... Uh, marching cubes algorithm in order to get the textured mesh right so so far the network gives you an SDF and a nerf and then you can use those to get uh, new images from a new viewpoint but then if you actually want the mesh and the texture you have to do an additional step as well which is this uh, marching cubes here so the volume rendering, this will just give you a single RGB picture and a depth picture, right, which you can then compare to the ground truth RGB and the ground truth depth. But if you want an actual 3D mesh that is textured, you have to do this uh, marching cubes step. Two-stage source view selection and ground truth prediction mixed training. Yeah, so really we want to know what the fuck is this ground truth that they're using, right? Because it seems to me like they need to have a synthetic data set for this. But let's see. Although the original sparse newspaper only demonstrated frontal view reconstruction, we have extended it to reconstruct 360 degree meshes in a single feed forward pass by selecting source views in a particular way and adding depth supervision during training. Anytime you see supervision, uh, supervised training means that you know what the target is, right? So in Classic classification is one of the most basic forms of supervised training, but in classification, for every single input, you have the actual desired output, the ground truth output, right? So that's that's what the supervised there means, that you, you know what the output should be, and then you can use that to, to create a loss and then basically push gradients based on that loss and based on that ground truth. But in this case, where are they getting that depth supervision, right? Where are they actually getting that ground truth? Our reconstruction model is trained on the 3D object data set. Boom. There you go. They finally did it. You know, this whole time, <laughs> they're they're talking about like, oh, it's like all this stuff over here and like it's not going to work because everybody just uses, uh, everybody uses 3D data sets and you don't want to be using 3D data sets, but and there they are using a 3D data set, so. Mm -hmm. They don't even tell you what the 3D data set is. Right? Like, they literally just mention it here, but they don't talk about it at all? Like, are we going to, what are they, what is this 3D data set? Is this some special Adobe 3D data set? We follow 0, 1, 2, 3 to normalize the training shapes and use a spherical camera model. So, normalize the training shapes probably just means resizing them so they're all relatively the same size. Uh, we first render N ground truth RGB and depth images from N camera poses uniformly placed on the sphere. Yeah, so the way that you can render ground truth RGB and depth images is because you have uh, the exact ground truth from the fact that you have the exact 3D object. So you wouldn't be able to do this for arbitrary objects. You'd only be able to do this if you had the exact object itself. For each of the n views, we use 0, 1, 2, 3 to predict four nearby views, and then we feed all of the 4 by n predictions with ground truth poses into the reconstruction module, and we can randomly choose one of the n ground truth RGB image views as the target view. We call this view selection strategy a two-stage view sort source, two-stage source view selection. We supervise the training with both the ground truth RGB and depth values. We argue that our two-stage view source selection is critical since uniformly choosing n by 4 source views would result in larger distances between the camera poses. Yeah, so kind of I think the key, one of the key ideas in this paper is this idea of like if you're viewing from here, right, of this object, rather than uh, getting 
uh, ground truth views that are kind of very dissimilar, right? So like you could have a ground truth view that's the front and then one that's the top and then one that's the back. Rather than doing that, what they're deciding to do is is just kind of like move it just ever so slightly, right? So like the, the four uh, views are basically the original view and then like a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, a little bit up and then a little bit down. So like ha just having a little bit of a difference between the uh, new view that you want to predict and then the view that you actually have I think that that small distance between the camera poses is key there. Uh, however, cost-based volume methods rely on very close source of views. When the relative pose is small, it can provide accurate and consistent prediction, and this can be used to find local correspondences and infer geometry. Yeah, so if you don't move the camera a lot, you can... Uh, what they mean here by local correspondences means that there's the parts of the image are the same, right? So like here in this uh, backpack, for example, you might have this bottle. And if you change the camera view too much, you're not gonna see this bottle anymore, right? But if you change the camera view only slightly, all of the camera view, all of the images are kind of guaranteed to have this same red bottle, the same uh, local correspondence of the red cap on this bottle in all those four images. And that allows you to basically create or get a better idea of like what the actual 3D shape is. Uh, we use end ground truth renderings in the first stage and enable depth loss for better supervision. During inference, we can replace the end ground truth renderings with 0, 1, 2, 3, and no depth input is needed. We will show in experiments that the ground truth prediction mix training is also important. To export the textured mesh, we use marching cubes. Yeah, and I think this is the... I wonder if they... Uh, account for this and they're 45 seconds so they say oh we uh, produce a mesh in 45 seconds is like does that also account for the time that it takes to do the marching cubes right is the 45 seconds just the inference or is it the actual marching cube step as well because this can be annoying uh, and the query the color of the mesh vertices although a reconstruction module is trained on a 3d data set we find that it mainly relies on local correspondences and can generalize to unseen shapes very well yeah i don't like that they haven't fucking told us what this 3D object data set is. Like, <laughs> that's not very transparent or open, right? Like, why aren't you telling us what this data set is? Camera pose estimation. Our reconstruction module requires camera poses for the four by N source view images. Note that we adopt uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 for image synthesis. Uh, in a canonical spherical coordinate frame, so... Here's your spherical coordinates. Well, we can arbitrarily adjust the azimuth and the radius on, of all source view images simultaneously. This parameterization requires knowing the absolute elevation angle of one camera to determine the relative poses of all cameras. Yeah, so out of, out of the three uh, parameters in a spherical coordinate frame, the elevation is the most important, right? The radius is almost irrelevant, right? Because the view of this Lysol container is the same whether you're one meter away from the object or three meters away from the object, right? So it's almost like the radius doesn't matter. What the most important one is this kind of elevation angle, which is this like almost like a pitch. So that's the one that they focus on. So this is they make a, a separate, uh, a whole separate module that predicts that elevation angle, right? That's what this uh, little part here is. Where is it? This elevation estimation, which is basically a little neural net that consumes a bunch of images and then uh, gives you this theta or an estimate of that theta. And I think part of the reason that this works is because the theta is actually very consistent, right? If you look at every single one of these images, almost every single one of these has the same theta, right? It's not like they're taking pictures where the theta is negative and it's like you're looking at the bottom of the image and then the theta is very big and you're looking at the top of the image almost all of these thetas are like within 10 degrees of each other right it's this kind of like three quarter like pose view so the consistency in that theta is potentially one of the reasons why they can predict it accurately uh this parameterization requires knowing the absolute elevation angle Relative poses between cameras and cameras vary for different, even when delta theta and delta phi are the same. Changing the elevation angles of all source images together 
will lead to the distortion of the reconstructed shapes. Uh, we propose an elevation estimation module to infer the elevation angle of the input image. We use 0, 1, 2, 3 to predict four nearby views. Then we enumerate all possible elevation angles in a course defined angle, course defined manner. For each elevation candidate angle, we compute the corresponding camera poses for the four images and calculate a reprojection error for the set of camera poses to measure the consistency between the images and the camera poses. Okay, so this is like kind of like a multi-step course define. Anytime you see that, basically it means they start with a crude guess and then they improve that guess over time, right? So it seems like they guess the elevation angle and then they use that to guess the angle again. Hmm. How are they fitting all of this into 45 seconds? For each input image, we generate n by 8, or n equals 8 images by choosing camera poses uniformly placed around the spherical surface and then generate four local images 10 degrees apart for each of the eight views. So here's the actual uh, delta in the uh, azimuth and elevation angles, resulting in 32 source view images. We freeze the 0, 1, 2, 3 model and train our reconstruction module on Objaverse Elvis. Okay, so they finally tell us what this data set is. It's Objaverse Elvis, which is 400 or 46,000 3D models. And then uh, Blender Proc is a Blender is a 3D uh, asset software. It's open source. I recommend it. You can do all kinds of things with it and it actually has uh, Python binding so you can control it with Python so it's very popular in uh, machine learning world if you're doing stuff with 3D to use Blender. Uh, okay, but they... Boo, you wanna come say hi to the stream? Here we go, here's Boo. Say hi. You don't wanna say hi? Okay. Uh, for images with background, we utilize an off-the-shelf segmentation network, SAM. Oh, look at that. They're using the SAM model. That's good. Look at that. Like, this is the uh, segmentation foundation model that uh, Meta released, and it's very strong and starting to become very popular, but it is non-commercial, which is kind of annoying with bounding box prompts for background removal. Okay, so here I guess we have examples. So here's the image of the bird. Here's the mesh. Here's the mesh with the texture on it. Some of these are good, some of these are trash. Like this minion kind of looks terrible. This horse also looks terrible. Look what it did with the tail kind of just made it this big blob. Uh, all right, and then figure six is they're comparing to other papers. So real fusion, 3D fuse, shape E, point E, and then this is the ground truth. So this is what the object looks like in the ground truth. This is Those are probably objects from this Objiverse Elvis data set. And... Oh, it kind of seems like it's pretty good, right? I'm looking at the uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 plus SD. I think SD means stable diffusion, so. None of these are, like, amazing, though. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> even this paper here of 0, 1, 2, 3, it's like none of these come close to the actual final object. Maybe this one is a little bit better, but it's like it's barely better than like real fusion and zero and shape is pretty bad, but it's barely better than this real fusion and like these are cherry picked, right? So you know that these are the best possible examples where their method looks the best and the uh other methods look the worst. So I don't know, it seems like a little bit better. I wouldn't call this necessarily like super state of the art. I feel like it's just a slightly it's on par, maybe. Single image to 3D mesh, we represent qualitative examples 
of our method illustrating its effectiveness in handling both synthetic and real images. We compare 1, 2, 3, 45 with existing. Is this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? Like that song, like Mambo number 5? I don't know. Uh, training on several million internal 3D data. Others are optimization based approaches, leveraging priors from stable diffusion. Error distribution of a predicted elevation. The median and average are 5.4 and 9.7 degrees. The fuck does this mean? Ablations on training strategies. What does this percent mean? Quantitative comparison on GSO and Objiverse. Internal 3D data, 2D diffusion models. This is also misleading because it's not just 2D diffusion models, it's 2D diffusion models plus the 3D object data set that they use, so this is actually misleading here. F score, clip similarity. I feel like these things are pretty much there, and I don't even like clip similarity as a metric. And I still feel like this 45 seconds is probably misleading. It's probably more than that. Either they're using something very powerful or they're not accounting for the uh, the neural, what, not neural, the cubes, marching cubes. While most methods generate plausible 3D meshes, notable differences exist amongst them in terms of quality adherence and overall 3D consistency. Notable differences exist amongst the cherry-picked examples. <laughs> Our approach uses SDF, favors better geometry. Our approach leverages a powerful 2D diffusion prior to directly produce high-quality multi-view images rather than relying on 3D space hallucination. Yeah, the hallucination is happening in the 2D diffusion model. Here, let's better results. Many approaches encounter challenges in achieving consistent 3D results, known as the Yanis problem. Right, so this is the, the multi-face problem that we're talking about, where it hallucinates faces on the front and the back. Several methods optimize each view independently. Our method capitalizes the view condition 2D diffusion model, inherently enhancing 3D consistency. We quantitatively compare on Objiverse and Google Scanned Objects GSO dataset. Uh, randomly choose 20 shapes. The apply ICP iterative closest point. This is everybody's favorite point cloud registration or point cloud matching algorithm. This is pretty old school. F score and clip similarity and the runtime on an A100 GPU. Okay. So it is a pretty hardcore GPU. Method outperforms all baselines, surpass all methods, but clip and F score aren't necessarily a good way to measure, so I don't see that as necessarily a good thing, or an impressive thing, sorry. Incorrect elevations lead to distorted reconstruction. Our elevation estimation module can predict an accurate elevation of the input view. Yeah, so they're showing here that the uh, reconstruction is very sensitive to the elevation, right? Which I think is just a matter of the fact that the elevation in the actual data sets are, are very limited is a very narrow band. Read meshes from different views shown in different colors. I guess this kind of looks better. I don't know. Uh, our 3D reconstruction module reconstructs a 3D mesh in approximately 5 seconds with the remaining time primarily spent on 0, 1, 2, 3 predictions which take roughly 1 second per image on an A100 GPU. 
Okay, so the 45 seconds is coming from 32 images times one second, and then five seconds for the mesh. Okay, so it is accounting for the marching cubes. Is there GPU accelerated marching cubes? Huh, okay, it looks like there is, okay. I wonder how annoying this is though, because you'd have to basically unload everything from the GPU and then run this marching cubes on the GPU and then load everything back onto the GPU, right? So if you're trying to generate shapes quickly, like lots of different shapes, you'd ideally want to keep this diffusion model on the GPU. You wouldn't have you wouldn't want to like take it off, run the marching cubes, then put it back on. So there's something there in terms of like how you want to prioritize GPU utilization. Found that without our two-stage source view selection strategy, a network trained to consume 32 uniformly posed predictions suffers from severe inconsistency among source views. If we feed only eight source views without the four nearby views, the reconstruction fails to capture local correspondences. Okay, so they did an ablation study where they just give it 32 uniformly sampled views versus the the technique that they used here where they have like eight source views and then like the little like slight differences from those eight source views. So it's like it's like little clusters of views as opposed to like a uniform sampling of the views. And it does seem like the little clusters works well, which it seems like is the best or the most interesting kind of result of this paper is that those little like clusters of views actually give you the best results. We first render end ground truth renderings, predict four nearby views. If we train directly on the ground truth renderings, fails to generalize. Our reconstruction module relies on accurate elevation angles of the input view. In figure 10, we demonstrate the impact of providing incorrect ele elevation angles, altering the elevation angles of source views by 30 degrees, which results in distorted reconstruction results. Our predicted elevation angles can perfectly match results with ground truth elevations. Rendering 1,700 images from random camera poses, but I still feel like the uh, elevation angle in those camera poses is more consistent than different. Again, it's like in every single one of these examples, I don't see a single one where the elevation angle is negative, right? Where it's like underneath the object and you're looking at the bottom. Every single one of these, the elevation angle is like the same kind of like top three quarter pose. Number of source views. Okay, so not very sensitive to the number of views as long as the reconstruction module is retrained. Reconstructs a 360 degree mesh primarily focuses on the frontal view reconstruction is to independently infer geometry for each view and subsequently fuse them together this actually is trash that's a terrible idea because <laughs> fusing geometry fusing meshes like that is very slow uh, integrating with an off-the-shelf text -to image 2d diffusion model can be naturally extended to support text -to image 2d tasks right Conclusion. In this paper, we present a novel method for reconstructing a high-quality 360-degree mesh of any object from a single image of it. In comparison to existing zero-shot approaches, our results exhibit superior geometry, enhanced 3D consistency, and a remarkable adherence to the input image. So, I mean, <laughs> none of these are, <laughs> these are all, like, kind of subjective. I would say this, this paper isn't, like, super state-of-the-art. It's just, uh, high quality, but it's not a step function improvement in what's currently out there. Reconstructs meshes in a single forward pass without the need for time consuming optimization. Uh, maybe. Resulting in significant reduced processing time, our method can be effortle effortlessly extended to support the text to 3D task. Okay, more comparisons. more examples. 
So here, these are all synthetic images. So these are basically images from an object in the object data set. So it's a very, very clean uh, image in that the, ma the background is basically perfectly masked out. You only have the object, right? And then here they're doing it with natural images where you have uh, a background to deal with and the background can make things more difficult. It makes it more uh, difficult to pull apart what's the background and what's the actual object of interest. So here the fact that their technique works with a real image, a natural image, is quite quite good but you can see here for example here they have a picture of the Lysol the same Lysol that they have here and obviously this uh, synthetic image of the Lysol results in a actually that mesh is kind of the same that's actually pretty impressive you see that this is the mesh reconstructed from the real image is actually about on par Mario doesn't look that good but some of these objects are more impressive so this burger is rotationally symmetric so it's easier to generate a burger or a stack of pancakes because they have that rotational symmetry versus like something like the Mario that has like very different faces or even like this uh, this fire hydrant because it has like these nubs that are on 90 degree like they're kind of like orthogonal to each other and you can see here how this method does a lot better with that. You see that mesh, how it does have the nubs in the correct direction versus something like shape E. It hallucinates the nubs on all the directions. More examples on text to 3D. Okay, and because they're using just a, uh, a single image, instead of just a single image that someone took with a cell phone, you could just use a single image that comes out of a diffusion model based on a text. So here they start with text, a wooden apple, they use a diffusion model to generate the actual image and then they do their uh, technique on that. And there you go, here's a tall tree with a hollow. Orange stool with green legs. And then Stable Dream, Dream Fusion is a uh, uh, previous paper that does text to 3D. I feel like it's good. Maybe I take back the fact that it's not that great. I feel like this is pretty good. Details of elevation estimation. We enumerate all candidate elevation angles in a course defined manner. So they're doing these like 10 degree offsets in the like little mini clusters of camera poses, the four predicted nearby views. using an off-the-shelf module lofter. So this is how they're identifying key points across images to calculate the camera pose. Hmm. For each triplet of images sharing a set of key points P, we consider each point P in P. We perform triangulation to determine the 3D location of P and then project a 3D point into a third image C and calculate the reprojection error. Yeah, so I mean, I don't like this weird reprojection error that they're doing to get the elevation estimation that includes this lofter step here like this just seems annoying you know ideally you'd be able to not have to do this course to find and use some kind of weird external thing here but 
details of training and evaluation. Here are the different losses. So the loss is composed of four losses, four sub losses. You have the RGB loss, which is the L1 loss between the rendered and ground truth color. Of course, you know what the ground truth color is because you are uh, using a 3D shape data set, so you know exactly what the color at each pixel is. And because it's a 3D shape data set, you also know what the depth is, right? You know exactly the distance from the camera to the indiv to the point on the mesh. Uh, so that's what LRGB and L depth are. Iconal and sparsity. I think we've seen these before. Yeah, these come from the sparse newspaper. I don't exactly remember what those are anymore, but you see here how uh, these lambdas are basically weights. So they tell you can whenever you have a loss like this that's composed of multiple losses, uh, you have to basically put these weights in front of each of the losses and then it allows you to basically tell the uh, the neural net optimization process how important is the RGB loss versus the depth loss versus this iconal loss and the sparsity loss. So if you see here, lambda zero equals one, which means that the RGB loss and the depth loss are about as important as each other, right? The depth and the RGB are both equally important. But you see here how lambda 1 and lambda 2 are very small, 0 0.1 and 0 0.00 or 0 0.02. So it basically means that this iconal loss and this sparsity loss are just kind of regularization terms. They're not super important. It's more important to get the RGB and the depth correct and then try to get the iconal and the sparsity correct a little bit. We utilize the Elvis subset of the Objiverse dataset, which consists of 46 3D 46K 3D models across all these categories, trained for 300K iterations across two A10 GPUs with a training lasting approximately six days. Yeah, and I feel like this is, there's, there's like kind of a disingenuousness here, right? I think like we went earlier up here in the paper and then in this table here, uh, they're saying that Shapey and Pointy are using uh, 3D data as a prior and that their technique only uses 2D diffusion models, but this is literally incorrect. This is, <laughs> they're using 2D diffusion models, but they're also using the prior that's coming from this Objiverse or Objiverse data set. So they're also using 3D data. So I don't know, that's, you can't lie to us like that. If you lie to us like that, I'm not gonna trust this paper. We evaluate all baselines using their official code base. We align the up direction result, blah, blah, blah. We perform a linear search over scale, rotation angles. We use ICP to align the transform mesh to the ground truth mesh. I've seen like uh, ICP uh, GIF mesh. Yeah, there's cool. This is a GIF. This is what iterative closest point it's an iterative method for aligning mesh meshes. You see, and it's basically, it looks every single point in the mesh gets compared to other points in the mesh, and then it tries to like reduce the distance between those. So this is the iterative nature of ICP. This is an old school technique at this point. Uh, and then some failure cases. Here the banana, it doesn't know what's going on with these peels. And here this weird like uh, Pokemon fox looking thing, it gets it wrong because it probably confuses the legs and the tail. Mm, look at that. They got their models from Sketchfab. And that's it. See if there's any appendices here. No, no appendices. Okay. Pretty cool. All right, let's take a big sip of Yerba Mate and let's do a summary. All right. So today we uh, reviewed the paper 12345 
any single image to 3D mesh in 45 seconds without per shape optimization. This is a uh, 3D shape generation paper and the shapes that they're generating are in the format of textured meshes, which is a set of vertices that are connected and then a uh, image that's called a texture, which is basically wrapped onto that mesh. So uh, I think the main comparisons would be shape E uh, from OpenAI and things like Dream Fusion. Uh, what else? So largely what they're using is a frozen pre-trained uh, diffusion model called uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. And then I think that the, the main trick that they're doing is they're basically taking an image and then guess, guessing the camera position for it and then using that guess in order to generate four kind of nearby uh, images that would basically be, this is what this object looks like with a slight change in elevation and then a slight change in azimuth, right? So you get these four nearby poses and then they're using those poses to create this ultimately this sine distance function and a nerf right so they have a mlp here that's predicting a color at every single point in a bounded 3d volume and that's effectively a nerf and then you have this uh sdf this mlp that predicts this sine distance function which is uh an implicit way of storing the surface of an object, right? So you could think of that like roughly the the density of like, is there an object here or is there not an object there? So once you have a nerf and this SDF, you can get 2D images from any novel view, or you can get the actual textured mesh using marching cubes. Um, what else? The nerf and the SDF are taking as input this geometry volume, which they described somewhere over here, but basically it's like, uh, it's based on these 2D features of the of the source images. So it's almost like the, I don't know, I don't really know exactly, to be honest, what, what this looks like, right? They kind of like give you this generic image of like this like pyramid looking thing but I think there's there's a little bit more I wish they would have shown us more examples of what this geometry volume and cost volume like what those actually look like like what are, what are the values in here like what's the resolution of the voxels here and so on but anyways this whole pipeline uh, they're pushing gradients into it from a actual 3d object data set so they have a 3d object data set which they're rendering with blender and they can get the color and the depth for any arbitrary view of this object. And then they basically just use these L1 losses and then push the gradients all the way back into this MLP here for the nerf, into this MLP here for the SDF, into this 3D convolution network here, and then into this elevation estimation module here. But they don't push any losses into this diffusion model, which is frozen. So that's kind of the TLDR of what the actual approach is. In terms of the results, it does seem like gives a little bit better models. It seems to suffer less from the Yanis problem that you see in a lot of these 3D generation pro or models, but it's still not orders of magnitude better than previous approaches. It still seems like kind of on par, the quality's kind of on par. And I think that largely that's because the, the, the key parts of this, which are the diffusion model, right? is about the same quality as the diffusion models for other approaches, right? So I feel like in order to make this uh, results for this much better, you would probably have to improve the quality of this diffusion model here, right? The 0, 1, 2, 3. And then you would have to use a much bigger and more varied 3D object data set for here when you're actually pushing the, the losses. So I still feel like they're using the same data, the same kind of scale of data, the same uh, kind of... Uh, I don't want to say the same generation of diffusion models. So roughly you're going to get the same result. Uh, things I didn't like about this paper is that they kind of mislead you a little bit and they make you think that 
all of their results just come from the priors of the 2D diffusion model. They kind of try to hide the fact that they're using a 3D object data set, but they are using a 3D object data set. And I also don't like that they use a couple different uh, kind of hard-coded algorithms. So they, they mention that they use uh, this off-the-shelf LOFTR module to like get a elevation angle in a course defined manner. I thought that was a little kind of weird. And then yeah, maybe that's it. But overall pretty cool. Pretty cool little paper. You know, nice and cozy paper for uh, Monday morning stream. Uh, thank you Gattaca and Madi for the comments on the chat. And uh, feel free to drop by on the Discord channel and suggest more papers that you're interested in. Uh, if not, have a great Monday. Like and subscribe and see you guys later.